talking about nutrition, um, swallowing and feeding tubes in this session. So um, we've got a, a few other speakers who I'll introduce um, as well. So we have next to me Tyron, who's uh, one of our trustees at DMD Pathfinders, and he's going to be talking about his own experience um, of, of kind of managing nutrition. And then we have um, Jody Allen, who's um, a specialist speech and language therapist working at Queen Square. And, uh, yeah, so I just want to tell you a bit about what we're doing around uh, nutrition, um, just as a, as a starting point. Can we have next slide? Okay, so um, DMD Pathfinders is currently working on a nutrition guide. We've currently got it in a um, draft form that we're just kind of finishing up, and uh, we're working with Jody as well as a um, specialist neuromuscular dietitian as well, um, Angela Reddy, who's, who's helping us out with that. Um, and we've done previous guides in the past, so one of the guides we did was on ventilation, that it's kind of just explores frequently asked questions about ventilation. It looked at um, different ways of uh, like different masks and mouthpiece and tracheostomy and that kind of thing. And it, it was, again, working with clinicians to get kind of advice to people on, on managing uh, respiratory issues. So that's what we want to do again with this, but on nutrition. And uh, the process that we use to do that is um, we usually create a, a working group. So let's just, um, like some of our adult members with Duchenne and uh, clinicians, um, we typically just have a, a meeting, a re you know, remote meeting on um, Zoom, or which is similar to Skype, um, and just kind of brainstorming about, you know, what would be useful information to have in the guide. Um, what do we know? What are people willing to to contribute? Because um, a lot of the um, the guide features uh, uh, comments and tips and advice from individuals in terms of what they do in terms of managing their own their own health um, after that working group we usually create a survey which we share with our users just to tell us about different aspects so you know we were asking about their experience with eating you know do, do, do people experience difficulty with chewing and swallowing and that, and that kind of thing what what kind of meals do people eat what other strategies do people use to you know maintain a healthy weight and what kind of questions do people have so again it's a way of um, just capturing what currently happens and also what people want to know and making sure that our guide actually tries to answer some of those questions so the next step is kind of drafting a guide so we'll look at you know what's the what's the evidence and what's the best practice out there from a range of sources that we can kind of pull together and put together in one place in uh, kind of easy to understand stand language. So um, yeah, f for the nutrition guide, I've um, kind of scoured various uh, research papers on uh, on nutrition. And, yeah, learned quite a lot of interesting stuff along the way and uh, yeah, kind of distilled that into, into a guide. And uh, I, as part of that, we obviously have the, the clinical input. So um, as as part of the drafting process, we'll then send it to the clinicians to make sure it's all medically accurate and kind of add in their own expertise. And uh, yeah, that's I think that's really it's really important. That it's a partnership between adults with Duchenne with their own experiences, but also the clinicians with their expertise and the yeah the clinical experience as well. And then once we finally got a guide, um, we will have it online on our website and easily shareable and we'll have hard copies as well that we with our ventilation guide we distributed these to specialist clinics for adults so I know you're often waiting a long time and they uh, the clinic so it's good to have something to read so um, yeah it's also good if that can be useful as well um, for the uh, nutrition guide what we're going to try and do also is is share a few videos of people um, talking about their own experience, so it's not just a, a, a guide that you, you had to read. And also, um, 
actually before all of this, I'll, I'll show that in a minute. It's uh, the I, a video that I produced talking about my own experience and and how I manage nutrition. Okay, just want to say why why we felt we needed a guide. Uh, well, we had a lot of questions. Um, so we've got a private Facebook group for adults with Duchenne and uh, got about 350 members from around the world. Only It's only open to adults with Duchenne. We had a lot of questions from people about about feeding tubes, when people need feeding tubes, what it's like to have a feeding tube, and kind of all that. And uh, and it, there were wider questions about nutrition as well, so we thought it would, you know, it's something that people really want advice on. Um, we also found there wasn't really a single source of information on uh, kind of all the aspects of, of nutrition. So, you know, thinking about feeding tubes, but also like managing your weight, getting weighed, um, everything to like, you know, bowels and constipation and, and that kind of thing. It wasn't wasn't all in one place in an easy to understand format. Um, but we did find there were quite a lot of tips out there from our members. So, you know, when people would ask a question, there were other other pathfinders that would come and say, well, you know, this is my experience, this is what I find useful. You know, even it, things down to like how to manage a, a feeding tube and, and you know, what, what to expect as well, but also, um, you know, the, the different ideas for like blending food and making it nice. So we wanted to make sure we could actually share that, that kind of information. And um, yeah, essentially nutrition is a, it's a vital part of, of staying healthy. So I think it's a, a, an important topic. Yeah, so I'll just tell you a little bit then um, about what I do, so um, I do a lot of blending of food. So for my breakfast, I have um, I like fruit and yogurt. So I have a, a plum and a pear and two prunes, and uh, yeah, blend that all up with some yogurt. And uh, the the idea of that is just to try and keep everything moving uh, properly. So it's quite good for my bowels. And generally, I find I don't actually have to use many laxatives. Um, so I've got them kind of as and when I need them, but generally I can manage things by by my diet. So um, that's that's quite key for me. Um, then when I have my lunches, then I tend to have soup. Um, again, just I find it's it's easier, and I I do kind of I just put a load of stuff into my soups, and so I make them quite quite substantial, and not they're not very well. To, watery they're kind of more like thicker substantial soups i'll put a lot of a lot of vegetables in them and uh often like leek and potato broccoli and stilton that kind of thing and uh I, I can also add um like sometimes i add things like um well cream cheese and uh other kind of high calorie stuff basically to um to boost the calories of that, and I just find it's easier because then uh, I'm not having to to chew and struggle with swallowing. And then, uh, I usually have a solid meal in the evening, uh, uh, but I usually still blend aspects of that. So, like, I I don't really like blending meat. Um, it's it just doesn't it doesn't quite taste the same. Um, I know some people do, and they can uh, you know make it quite nice, but um, yeah, I tend to have solid kind of a bit of chicken or something, so, um, something softer, and blend the vegetables. And uh, yeah, it, it usually it works quite well for me, um, and just kind of it minimises the amount of chewing and swallowing I got to got to do. So I think I, that means I kind of can manage to do a little bit still. Um, yeah, my main focus is um, just really making it as easy as, as possible for me. Uh, I think I have, having said that, I have experienced more difficulties with swallowing recently. I think that's because, um, just because of, I've been to a lot of different events and trips and I often can't eat the diet that I would usually eat because I'm off out places, so that can be, be a bit more difficult. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get a bit better about, um, you know, being prepared to bring my own 
my own food with me and actually make that work. But it's um, yeah, it's it's an ongoing challenge. But so far, I managed to avoid needing a, a feeding tube. I know a lot of people get on well with them, but um, for me, I I prefer not to unless I really need it. So um, yeah, I've tried to manage it with my my diet as much as possible. Okay, um, so that was just a bit about my experience. I'm going to hand over now to Jody, who's going to be talking about um, well, dys dysphagia and uh, chewing and swallowing issues. So thank you, John. I'm Jody. I'm one of the speech and language therapists who um, I consider myself pretty lucky because I get to work with a lot of young men with Duchenne muscular dystrophy amongst uh, a whole range of um, muscle-related um, issues down at Queen Square in our neuromuscular centre. Um, and prior to that was in Birmingham, actually up here in a, a neuromuscular respiratory clinic as well. So um, some of the work that we've been doing within speech therapy is about trying to educate a lot of speech therapists about the problems that do occur in Duchenne and other muscle conditions because I don't know what your experiences are, um, but perhaps when you see healthcare professionals that don't work um, in specialist centres, maybe their understanding of the conditions are not as up to speed, which is absolutely fair enough because the expectation is that clinicians have to see a lot of different um, conditions. Um, but I'm just going to echo what John was saying, actually. Um, the kind of developments that we're making in, the, in Duchenne and nutrition and swallowing is very much a partnership um, between clinicians and our population because we learn as much, if not more, from our patients as we do in terms of upskilling and educating our patients. So... Um, that's where the partnership is, and we're trying to kind of keep progressing things forwards and share information as much as possible. Um, so the kind of primary issue, I don't, um, you may or may not be familiar with the term dysphagia, which is essentially the scientific term for swallowing problems. Um, and the, the kind of issues for us as clinicians is that swallowing problems or dysphagia in the Duchenne population when particular uh, kind of early on in childhood are not considered a primary issue um, in the kind of profile of Duchenne. But as we see um, patients coming through transition and into our adult clinics, um, and our caseload is somewhere between the ages of 16 and 40 plus, um, you start to see that actually there are some underlying swallowing issues that maybe we didn't recognize as well a few years ago. Um, so with that increased life expectancy, we're seeing these issues come to fruition. Um, and historically, we've always used enteral feeding, as John was saying, to manage weight loss and to manage swallowing problems. But the feeding tubes that I certainly see in adults, if any of our patients come through already with a feeding tube, often it's been to manage the weight loss rather than a, a primary swallowing problem. If you compare swallowing problems in Duchenne with a, another um, patient with a different neurological condition, the profile is much more complex because you're lo not looking at a swallowing problem in isolation. You're looking at uh, changes all over. So the difficulties that you would have in preparing and, and feeding would probably precede issues with the swallowing. Issues further down past the swallowing in the stomach the interaction between breathing and swallowing because they essentially use the same tube. There may be appetite related issues and posture and positioning is pretty critical. So we have to look at swallowing and dysphagia in the whole profile. In terms of which muscles change um, in Duchenne, these are the posh terms, but I'll put some pictures up. So these are the kind of primary muscles we would look at from a speech therapy point of view to see which ones are perhaps weaker in the swallowing process. So um, lip seal is usually fairly pres well preserved, so we don't usually have any issues at that point. Some of the muscles that tend to change quite early on, and perhaps in pediatrics, are the muscles that control chewing. And usually, 
the patients will present early on to us saying that chewing is problematic to me and that's because these sets of muscles do weaken. The other ones are the tongue muscles. Now the tongue muscles don't get, uh, become weak enough that it affects your speech um, but they do become weak enough to affect the swallowing and the tongue is a huge huge ball of muscle which contracts which pushes against the back of your throat as you swallow. In Indushed and that muscle will usually become a little bit weak so you don't get that nice squeeze through the throat so you usually the presenting symptom is food sticking in the throat and that starts putting people off eating and drinking and might be that where people start using softer foods or start blending or using purees. The soft palate, that dangly muscle at the back of the throat is usually pretty well preserved. We don't usually see problems with things coming out of the nose but the muscles directly to the throat do start to weaken as well. They wouldn't be really obviously weak to anybody else. Um, but if you look in detail, those muscles that contract as you swallow and squeeze lose a little bit of power and then you run the risk of not closing off the airway quite as well as you swallow and then you are more prone to things going down the wrong hole or aspiration is the scientific term. So that's the kind of physiology that we're learning about. Um, there's a group in the Netherlands that are really helpfully looking in much more detail at those muscles. Um, so I can give you those references if you wanted to have a read yourself. As well as that muscle weakness, the other challenge and the other balance that we're trying to make here is um, between swallowing and breathing. The tube in your throat has two functions. It's used for breathing and talking, it's used for swallowing. And as you swallow, the swallow function itself switches quickly between a breathing tube and a feeding tube. Um, so coordinating breathing and swallowing is one of the challenges in more advanced Duchenne. As you swallow, you rely on quite a lot of pressure in the lungs to get a good swallow. And if your lungs are weaker, you don't get that lovely pressure that you would like to see in a good swallow. And often you would see piecemeal or fragmented swallowing. So in a, in a, a well-functioning swallow, you might swallow your whole mouthful down in one. Um, in a more fragmented swallow, you might put something in your mouth and you have to swallow it in five pieces. So it takes much longer to get through your meal. The other thing that's worth being aware of as well, and it's not in the literature, and this is something we looked at last year, most of everything you know about Duchenne muscular dystrophy is about motor changes, and there's not really any report of sensory changes. But if um, you, we look in any more detail, and we use x-ray swallows um, quite a lot, um, and if you look on an x-ray, there are signs that in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, there are some sensory changes. We don't know why at the moment, but that's important for us to acknowledge as clinicians because it means that swallowing changes might be occurring that we don't necessarily pick up straight away. So it might be that things are going down the wrong way and we don't naturally cough or have one of those responses that you, you would normally expect to see, coughing, eye-watering, difficulties with breathing. It can be silent. I suspect a lot of this is much later on um, in the disease process. So in terms of picking up changes in the swallowing, we look at two fairly robust assessments. Your speech therapist will look at the muscles from the outside, they'll look at you eating and drinking, but then it's never as good as looking at what's going on the inside. So this here is a swallowing x-ray. You may or may not have heard of it. The partial name is a videofluoroscopy. And on the other side, this is a, looks a bit more swanky now, this kit, but this is essentially a tiny camera on, a, on the end of a tube and we pop it in the nose and we look down. So we see some images of the throat from a bird's eye view. Um, and when I offer it to my patients, the first response is, no, thank you very much. And the ones that have, including myself, all go, oh, it's not as bad as I thought it would be. The benefits of that one, this one here on the right, is that it can be done. If you've got the kit, you can do it there and then, and you don't have to get rebooked for an x-ray three weeks later. <clears throat> so they're the kind of gold standard assessments that we would routinely use to look at swallowing changes. 
And the sorts of things you might see on these x-rays, um, not that I'm expecting you to interpret them, but you would see um, patches of, so on this x-ray you might see this black area here is what we would give to patients, but you might see that holding up in the throat right next to the airway. So that might be where our patients are saying food sticking. And the risk is that as you carry on breathing and talking, you might find that some of that goes down the wrong hole. And this is a bird's eye view. <coughs> this here is nice and clear. This is the airway. But round here, you can see that there's some, uh, a little bit of lunch still sat around next to the airway. Um, and it might be that our patients are saying it's there, which is great, and we can do something about it. Or it might be there and we've lost a bit of awareness. So that's why we would look at it with, with tools rather than just looking from the outside. In terms of our management of um, swallowing problems in Duchenne, the first line management is always the path of least resistance. So we have a lot of conversations, myself and the dietitian, about do we always need to go down the, tube, the route of tube feeding? And we try to avoid that if we, can, if we can get in there early and pick up swallowing problems early and manage the nutrition. So if you've got a swallowing problem, you might then become compromised with your nutrition because you can't manage all your calories. So if you can, if your speech therapist and your dietitian will work with you, um, the first line management is not to default to a feeding tube, it's to see if we can get all the calories in safely without any major issues. So hopefully the team around you should be a speech therapist, there should be a dietitian involved at that point if there's some swallowing problems. We would usually have a physiotherapist on board as well because if you've got swallowing problems and the risk of food and drink going down the wrong way is present, a respiratory physiotherapist is pretty crucial in trying to keep that chest nice and clear. Um, and we would also um, have a chat with the neurologist and our respiratory doctors as well because we like to think nice and early that if we do get to the point of wanting to go down the feeding tube route, we would need to check out the respiratory system to see if there's any risks of going through any feeding tube procedures um, and check in with the neurologist that there's nothing else that's contraindicating that. So that's the first line management. Um, and the other two assessments we might get early on are our, our anaesthetist assessment, in case there's any sedation required later on for any feeding tube placements, and a gastroenterologist to look at the rest of the, the tract, so right from the feeding tube through the stomach and the bowels. So there's a big team around that need to be talking to each other around um, each of our patients. But our first line management um, and actually might be the only management we have to put in place for the lifetime of um, our patients, are putting in some place, place some swallowing strategies and some self-management. And that's where it's very much a, a relationship, a two-way process where we would negotiate that and our patients teach us and we teach, teach them. Um, looking at trying to get some optimizing the calories by liquidizing or pureeing foods, because if you make the swallowing process easier, you can get the more calories in, as John was saying earlier. Make sure that there's a really robust chest management plan in place, um, so that if anything wants to go down the wrong way, we know what we're looking for early, and we try and prevent any admissions with pneumonia caused by food and drink going down the wrong way. We talk early about, we discuss the future early, and what may or may not be in line with each of our patients' wishes. Um, and then we talk about the suitability of second line management, which at this point is enteral feeding, tube feeding, um, at that point, because some of our patients have very strong wishes that they don't want to go that, down that line. Make sure there's always a review appointment, and we make sure that people know who to contact if things aren't working. And the second line management at the moment where we're at is, is usually tube feeding. Um, rarely do we have, we rarely, rarely is it major gastric tube feeding, so feeding won't happen by the nose unless it's an acute hospital admission with a chest infection perhaps, um, and we have to put a temporary calories in place. More often than not, it's um, a small insertion in the stomach as a more permanent option. 
the kind of rationale for tube feeding, there's two main reasons and a whole load of other ones. Um, and the main reasons are if any of our patients are getting recurrent infections from food and drink going down the wrong way, or there's an issue with nutrition. But also, it's about maintaining quality of life. And if you're living with challenging swallowing and challenging nutrition, actually quality of life can be improved by having a feeding tube and taking the pressure off and the stress. But one size absolutely doesn't fit all, particularly in this particular muscle condition in Duchenne. You can't predict um, often with the swallowing and the nutrition where things are going to go, other than getting in there early so you can make sure you navigate that route and you're in control of that route. Um, and all of the whole, all of our patients are in very different um, positions. Doesn't matter on the it dependent. It's not age dependent at all. Not necessarily mobility dependent either, or respiratory dependent. It's very slightly more unpredictable. So we do have people who don't have feeding tubes at all and are managing to eat and drink on ventilation. Those who aren't using ventilation and perhaps are losing a little bit of weight and need a boost from a feeding tube. But we also have people come to us with recurrent infections from food going down the wrong way. So um, there's no defined absolute route. In terms of research and swallowing, where are we at in Duchenne? Well, um, there's obviously lots of research going on about treating the Duchenne as a whole, but within the swallowing side of things, there are no particular drug treatments or cell treatments or surgical treatments available at the moment with Duchenne, but there are things emerging which are quite exciting in these areas to maintain function and to treat some of the underlying issues. So in terms of physical training, that's that very typical kind of physiotherapy approach to maintaining muscle function. Um, a team again over in the Netherlands, this was a couple of years ago, and they've started, it's a very early um, research trial where they looked at using chewing gum um, with their patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy to see whether you can preserve chewing function. Now, there was only 17 patients, so it's not a big research study, so don't, um, please don't go home saying let's chew, chew chewing gum and that will solve the problem. Um, but the, uh, the early evidence was that actually it didn't strengthen or maintain strength, but it did improve skill. So you're not maintaining muscle strength, but you're um, improving muscle skill in, um, by chewing the gum, which may or may not then carry over to eating and drinking. So I'm showing you this just to show you that there are things that are changing and developing. Swallowing strategies are pretty much the mainstay at the moment. There's, no, there's not lots of research on um, whether you should absolutely puree your diet, whether you should add liquids with your foods to wash things down, but it's all based on what we understand from the muscle changes. So um, if you know that these certain muscles are affected, we know that in other populations, doing this actually does help. So if you reduce how solid the foods are and if you drink with meals, you use gravity and gravity helps you get things through rather than relying completely on muscle contraction. The other um, couple of studies that are, again, reasonably hot off the press here, but this was a pure um, Duchenne study, and they're looking at the interactions between breathing and swallowing, which I think is probably where we're at in terms of the future developments. Um, so they were looking at people eating and drinking on NIV and off NIV, so nasal NIV, um, and found some certain parameters of swallowing were improved on the NIV because the NIV was supporting the breathing, the body could focus on the swallowing side of things. But this particular study was a pretty nifty piece of kit where there was um, each of the patients had control over the onset of the NIV. So some of the challenge, challenges we have at the moment are about suppressing that the breath of the NIV as you swallow because it could equally introduce risk. But a lot of our patients become very proficient at managing that and teach themselves. The kind of key lessons to kind of wrap up um, for a lot of our patients that we teach are 
about not ignoring the symptoms. And symptom onset is usually very slow, so it's very difficult to pick up the, the sudden onset symptoms, but it's about monitoring and reflecting back. So reflect back six months, 12 months, to, does this look different to how it was a year ago? Um, making sure that the time is absolutely there to for shoot, uh, food to be chewed down well, because if it's not well chewed, um, the tendency to cause choking problems is there. So rushing through meals on a busy schedule is less than ideal. Um, starting to avoid or adapt tricky or hard foods is usually one of the first line management um, approaches and um, maybe moving towards more blended foods part of the day to get the calories in. Sipping water can help when you're eating to clear the throat, usually throughout the meal rather than having a big, big drink at the end of the meal because usually then you get some interaction between what's left in the throat and the water and you can cause all sorts of problems. Trying to avoid talking and eating because you're then using the same air, air, airway or the same tube for two different functions. Try aiming to sit upright during but also after the meal to prevent reflux and regurgitation. Um, and also knowing your body the best and instructing the people around you who are feeding you because they it, it's very difficult unless you're in that situation to understand how um, how important it is to have the right feeding techniques and knowing who to contact if things aren't right or things haven't we haven't managed it um, as well as we could have done um, one of the things that um, a lot of our patients come to us which raise alarm bells are people coming to me saying I have to use my cough assist during my meals now and that's usually a, a bit of a red flag for me because that makes me think if you're needing to use your cough assist during meals that's not necessarily a good sign. So to wrap up, swallowing or dysphagia care um, we would recommend being proactive, trying to prevent problems before they occur and a multidisciplinary approach most importantly with the patient or um, our clients there and the rest of the team around, not necessarily all in the same room, but in communication. We try and safeguard against malnutrition before it occurs and prevent hospital admissions from pneumonia caused by food and drink going down the wrong way. But it has to be realistic, it has to be achievable um, and ultimately has to promote um, the independence and quality of life of all of our young men with Duchenne. Um, and absolutely centred around that individual and what works for one patient doesn't work for, for everybody, of course. I think that wraps it up. I'm really happy to take questions. Do you want to do yeah, that at the I'll end, John? Uh, yeah? Is there anything? Who would you go to to find out? I mean, would you go to the right people and say, listen, you have Yeah, um, if you think there's some problems with swallowing. Yeah. 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 So, um, yes, you could go to the dietitian if you're already linked with the dietitian. Um, your GP should always be able to initiate a local speech therapy referral. So that's the kind of routine way that any patient with swallowing problems will get referred. Um, and then from there on in, I mean, we, like I say, we're lucky enough to work in a centre that we see a lot of patients with Duchenne, but we also spend a lot of time talking to speech therapists or dietitians. So you're saying in the Queen, do you work at the Queen's? Um, so, yeah, I'm at Queen Square at the, at the Queen moment. Square, yeah. da Daniel's, uh, my son, he's under the um, Lane Fox Union at yeah. St Thomas's. Yeah. So I suppose just say you've got concerns and yeah. then they'll... Yeah, um, and, and flag them up as soon as you notice them, because sometimes local referrals can take a bit of time to... Uh, as I'm sure probably some people are aware, it's not a matter of days. Um, so flag them up really early because then at least when the assessment takes place, you know, you're not so far down the line that you're really in trouble. Right, but GP yeah, is usually yeah. a good point. If they're already at Lane Fox or at a certain centre, ask the doctors or the, the staff there to refer into speech therapy. Right, okay. I'll, yeah. I'll do that then. Because he's fighting it at the moment. He's 25. And that probably, as some of the guys know, you don't want to give in to anything yeah. um, because it's something else. Yeah, <laughs> but I think he's getting to that point where he should really go. Yeah. He's not in here, he's, he's in one of the others, mm -hmm. so he wouldn't come in here. But I said I'd come in and yeah. find out the information for him. But it yeah. looks like you can go on websites and go on yeah. your uh, Pathfinder website.
find out a lot more information. So, brilliant. Thank you. No problem. recently who didn't, didn't know that yeah it's um, a bit of a misnomer and it's a misnomer for us because rarely do I work with speech problems now but our job titles haven't changed so yeah speech therapists it's certainly in adults deal with a lot of swallowing related issues so if someone says you've been referred to a speech therapist don't be alarmed because um, often I'm met with it's fine I can speak <laughs> so <laughs> yeah good point John you mentioned that then No, um, the esophagus doesn't usually scar. What you usually get is um, the muscles that contract, that push things from right from the lips right through to the esophagus, just start to weaken. So they don't scar, you just lose a little bit of muscle power, and much like you do in the arms and the legs, but later on into the, into the pharynx. So if you lose that power in the muscles, what happens is you don't get that lovely squeeze all the way through and if you don't get that lovely squeeze you get residue sticking in the throat and you might not close your windpipe off as well and if your airway is open halfway through your swallowing that's when you run the risk of things going down the wrong path. So those are the three symptoms that you show, yeah. you could view that as a baseline just in one series and a couple of years to see how it's going. Yeah so we don't like to over investigate um, because x-rays have radiation exposure you know it's not nice to have a camera in your nose um, but if we have somebody perhaps who comes to us with early changes depending on the nature of the problem um, we might do an x-ray just so we can tailor the, the strategies a bit better so as long as we think that x-ray is going to change what we do we would we would do it yeah To some extent, he's still relatively able-bodied in that he can lift his arms high enough to feed yeah. himself. Yeah. Um, but he has had recurrent problems with choking, okay. um, which makes, obviously, the school quite nervous. Yeah. And they, um, but he's at an age where he absolutely will be choosing what he's having for dinner, thanks, and nobody will be telling him. Yeah. And so people just kind of hover around trying to make sure that he's not going to choke. Yeah. Um, is there anything basic that I should be doing? I have spoken to the neurobacillar consultant about it, but... We're not, we don't have any other people involved. We do have respiratory physio. Okay. Um, his lung function is about 40%. Okay. Um, but otherwise, we don't have any kind of yeah. other people around or we haven't been given any guidance other than kind of, yeah, chew it better or, you know. Yeah. But he's a <laughs> um, is there anything I could be doing that's basic? I think um, one thing that's really important with these sort of early signs of swallowing problems, like choking, is that actually... Um, a differential diagnosis so people can choke for uh, so I occasionally choke and that's not because I've got a swallowing problem it's because mm. occasionally I am not very good at concentrating or I try and multitask or whatever that is and it might be at 11 maybe there are some changes in the muscle function or maybe actually the muscles are functioning okay and there are other reasons why he might be choking so you would hate to be very extreme and start pureeing foods to mm. stop him choking if actually that's not going to make a difference. Mm. Um, I mean, I would say get, ask for a referral to a speech therapist because at least then they might be able to give you a bit more of an idea as to why it's happening. You might have a, an idea yourself because you might see, see a pattern in the choking events, often a kind of choking diary or parents who keep an eye on actually what what was the trigger for that choking mm. then you can unpick it a little bit more but I'm always hesitant to, to give out generic advice because it might be of the wrong course, advice yeah. so but yeah maybe a referral would not do any harm mm. certainly at 11 because then you're in the system before I head over to Tyron I just wanted to cover some of the um, some of the things that came out of our, our survey that um, you might find interesting and uh, kind of follows on from, from what Jodie's been talking about. So um, this is the survey that we did to inform the nutrition guide that we're writing. So um, we did this um, well just a few months ago, it finished, and uh, we had 
91 responses um, and not all of these were adults and were relatives of adults, um, but it covered um, adults aged from, well, 18 to 50. And um, only, uh, I, I mean, obviously it was self-selected, so the people that um, completed the survey, um, probably you might expect that they already had some kind of issues around nutrition. That's why they were interested in the topic. So, um, yeah, it's not necessarily representative of the whole adult population but of the you know the survey respondents um 12 percent were unable to eat at all so uh, and that includes a lot of feeding tube users so um it, it wasn't too high but obviously for some people it does become an issue where the, the swallowing gets um, becomes a, a risk um for people and so they're not able actually to eat because it's just yeah too much risk of of choking and aspiration um, then we asked a load of questions in terms of difficulties people experienced, and we had, um, you know, the options were always, often, occasionally, or or never. And um, so, looking at the people said, who said occasionally or more than occasionally, so at least occasionally, 78% of people were experiencing tiredness when eating. Uh, but then. 81% were experiencing difficulties swallowing, at least occasionally. And 78% were experiencing difficulties chewing, at least occasionally. So it shows you that it's actually really high. And, uh, you know, this is something that a, a lot of people are um, experiencing some difficulties with. And, uh, yeah, interesting, 28% of our respondents took more than 30 minutes to finish their their main meal, so uh, again, it is impacting on people in terms of how long it takes to, to finish a meal. And um, of course, the longer it takes, the more likely people are to just give up because they're tired of it, basically. So that's that's quite a risk in terms of, of losing calories. And then what I found really interesting is 87% of people experience problems with abdominal bloating. So yeah. Um, I think that's something that maybe people don't realize is, is really common. Um, and, yeah, I mean, obviously there can be a, a, a range of reasons for that. Um, often the the ventilation doesn't help if the um, if it's not invasive ventilation and the, the pressures can be too high, then uh, air can often be forced down to the stomach, which, which can be an issue. Um, okay. And then just in terms of some of the, the comments uh, that we got from people, so um, th th this is the kind of uh, advice that we'll be including in our guide. So um, this is someone who uh, was still eating, didn't, didn't have a food, uh, feeding tube. So to avoid certain food, particularly with a crumbly or chewy texture, often make smooth soups and creamy sauces or, or gravies to have with food just to make it easier to swallow. So I often use Rulon for stocks or sauces. I find fish easiest to eat. I have food cut up small. I try not to talk when eating and always have a drink handy. Very long drinking straws. Okay. And then we had people commenting, I'm not going to read this out, but we had people commenting on feeding tubes. So um, what we asked of the people that had feeding tubes is what would you say to an adult with Duchenne who was thinking about having a feeding tube or might need one? And uh, Yeah, I think overall the comments were very positive and uh, really just saying that, yeah, it, it's worth doing and it, it can make life a lot easier. So uh, I think I think it's really useful to have that that information from people and I'm sure Tyrod will, will add his own perspective as well. Oh, and here was another uh, another submission on our survey. It was um, someone who's uh, got an Instagram account called uh, Battle the Bite. And uh, we shared this on our, our Facebook page before. But it's basically um, someone who has a relative with Duchenne, and they spend a lot of time kind of experimenting with different recipes and pureeing them into... Yeah, making them really easy to swallow. So there's there's some really great, interesting uh, recipes there. And, uh, you know, although the food might not look great, it 
tastes good. So, and it's about experimenting with different different tastes. So it might all look like slop, but it's lots of different flavors and uh, you know lots of lots of different um, different recipes. So it's definitely worth uh, checking out if you do need to to puree your food because yeah, it may not look the nicest, but it can still taste good. Okay, so these are the th things that our advice guide is is going to cover. So um, things like, you know, what's a healthy diet? What kind of uh, nutrients do we need? Uh, things like maintaining a healthy weight. So it's about it's about recognizing how things change uh, during the course of Duchenne. So as you're younger, the focus is much more about um, not being overweight and, and managing that. But then there's you know a critical point at which the chewing and swallowing becomes more difficult, the breathing becomes more difficult, and then at that point the weight it tips the other way, and then the the challenge is always to make sure you're not becoming underweight, and then uh, and and then after as people tend to get things sorted, like they might move on to permanent ventilation, then it again becomes uh, an issue about making sure you don't become too overweight. So it's it's that. It changes depending on your needs, but it's about maintaining a healthy weight. So we go into that um, detail. We talk about um, the swallowing problems, but also the muscles involved in chewing and how that they're effective, affected. Um, covering things like you know dental problems as as well that can make that more difficult. Uh, we talk about swallowing strategies, so some of the stuff that um, Jody's already, already mentioned. Talk about ventilation, nutrition, and kind of managing that. Um, particularly when you're transitioning to, to needing more ventilation and uh, the impact that can have on, on nutrition and vice versa. And then we talk a bit about feeding tubes and uh, you know, what's involved in having a feeding tube, how they work, how you look after them. Then we cover s some kind of other gastrointestinal problems that might be affected by Duchenne. And we talk about bowels and constipation, of course. Lots of people have lots of things to say about poo, we find. And uh, then we're, we're kind of ending it with our, our top tips, really, and uh, yeah, things to, things to look out for. So, yes, I'm now um, going to hand over to Tyron. He's going to be talking a bit about his own experience. So. Okay, um, a radiographically um, inserted gastronomy tube or rig is used when it is not possible to take an adequate nutrition by mouth. This means the tube is placed through the skin into the stomach under X-ray guidance, which is why it's called a rig. Um, usually special liquid nourishment can be administered via the rig um, with a feeding pump and given set. Um, four, um, four and a half years ago, after having a tracheostomy, it was decided that I should have a feeding tube fitted to support my nutritional needs as I was struggling to swallow and was only managing small amounts of puree food. This was a precautionary measure in case I was unable to eat and knew that I'd be able to allow this method if I became ill. Um, the, the difference between a percutaneous endoscopy gastronomy tube a pig and a radiographically inserted gastronomy tube, a rig is a procedure in which it is surgically inserted into your stomach. A pig is inserted by using an endoscope camera via your mouth into your stomach to view the, the stomach lining. Um, when the incision site for the pig is located, a small incision is made 
under the skin. It will then be, be secured in place and checked, and its position checked with an endoscope. As a result, sedation is, is required and patients need to be able to lie comfortably flat for 30 minutes. Um, this is not a general anesthetic, but it makes people drowsy and they are not able to remember the procedure. A pig is the standard and most um, reliable way to do this procedure, but it's not possible in all patients, in which case a rig is a very safe alternative. In DMD patients with significant respiratory weakness and relying on non-invasive ventilation or invasive ventilation, which is a tracky, such patients might also be very sensitive to small doses of sedatives. If a pig is felt unsafe to do, then a, a, a rig is used instead which can be performed without sedation. Um, to have a rig x-rays are used to locate the incision site. During the procedure, air might be pushed into your stomach via a nasogastric tube to inflate it and help place the tube accurately. An incision is made under local anesthetic in the skin and is passed through with the use of a thin needle. It will be secured in place and is position checked using X-ray. Okay. And presently, I only use my rig for administering medication twice a day. However, this works well as it means that the tube is being flushed daily and kept clean. It is, importantly, it is wise to keep the feeding tube site clean at all times, avoiding any infections. Um, in my routine, I clean the site twice a day in the morning during my bath of soap and water and then in the evening with saline water and gauze. Um, the site needs to be kept dry after being cleaned to prevent soreness, redness and becoming itchy. Um, Weekly, it is necessary to change the, the water in the balloon as it evaporates over time. This is done by using a syringe to draw out the rema remaining water from the balloon. Um, when this, when it is replaced, okay, which is then replaced with five mils of sterile water. It's crucial to prevent the feeding tube from being caught or pulled during hoisting and movements, which will cause trauma and bleeding if not addressed. My approach to stop this occurring is to use two circular cotton wool pads as a dressing with an incision to the center. This is placed around the tube to protect the skin in this area. Gauze is then used as padding underneath the tube and secured with hyperfix tape. It is advisable to use, avoid using dressings and tape that are going to irritate the skin. Um, my rig is um, routinely change the home every three months in order to avoid 
the silicon piercing and to prevent infections. The first step was to get everything prepared for the procedure, which was includes using a sterile pack containing a, a sterile sheet, gloves and gauze. We, we also get the new gastronomy tube, skin cleansing foam, KY jelly, pH indicator strip, sterile water and syringes. Um, the next step is to open the sterile pair and place the sterile sheet on the table. Then I lay everything out. The carer opens the gastronomy tube and tests the balloon by putting in five mils of sterile water to make sure the balloon inflates. Um, the, the, the water is then removed and KY jelly is applied to the end of the tube. When changing my rig, I'm on the bed with the backrest raised to a 45 degree angle. Skin cleansing foam is applied around the rig sites and wiped clean with gauze. Then the balloon is deflated before removing the old gastronomy tube. Immediately, the new tube is inserted at the same angle, making sure there's enough lubricant on the end of the tube so that it easily glides in. Yep. After this, the balloon is inflated with five mils of sterile water and checked it is inflated properly. A small sample of gastric fluid is drawn out of the stomach with a syringe and placed on a pH indicator strip to check that the tube is positioned correctly. A pH of 5.5 or below is acceptable as indicating gastric placement is perfect. Um, it is essential to have a plan in place with your Nutritional team, if the tube accidentally falls out or migrates, if the tube falls out, the, the track will close within a few hours. So you should always have a fallout kit available to use until you can replace it with a new feeding tube or visit your local hospital if necessary. In, in conclusion, I'm pleased that I had the rig put in as it gives me the comfort knowing that if I ever become ill, I can rely on it for my nutritional nourishment. Thanks for listening and I hope it has given you an understanding about a rig and a pig. That's it. Any questions? Ticket. It'd be great to hear from you. So, yeah, any any questions or any um, tips, advice that you want to share? Please, uh, please feel free. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, John. Uh, I've got a, a question really around uh, whether you use any supplements or any additional kind of vitamins or any green powders, alkalizing powders, anything like that, just to sort of boost your diet. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I don't personally, but I know, um, you know there's a lot of um, interest in, in the supplements. I know there has been, uh, like there is more and more research coming out now. Um, I think, um, and I know uh, Angela Reddy, who we've been uh, working on the guide with, she's previously presented about, um, about nutraceuticals and, and the, the potential there. So I think, um, there definitely is potential. Um, I guess I haven't really spent the time to, to look into it, but I think it is worth looking into. I think um, it, it is also important to be quite cautious about what you do use, because I think there's, uh, I think nutrition is one of those 
areas where there's so much pseudoscience out there in terms of, um, y you know, people that have a vested interest in uh, promoting certain supplements and there isn't really any kind of scientific basis. But alongside that, there's also, like, not really enough research done into, I into supplements. So, you know, there are always going to be stuff out there that does work, but there's a load of stuff out there that doesn't work and people that are promoting uh, things for their own interests. So I think you've got to be really careful about making sure you look into these things fully and understand the, you know, the scientific basis and uh, get understand who's recommending it and, wh and where that recommendation has come from. But I think it's there's a lot of potential there, definitely. Uh, this is just a... Um Maybe a very naive question, but for uh, for carers, um, as if you're caring for boys in their uh, early early teens, let's say, um, are there things to look out for? Um, I, I, I don't know specific specific changes that that are going so slowly that n no one might notice, or, or uh, um, you know, on a day to day basis, you don't you don't see a difference. Um, but are there are there things that you would recommend? Um, advice that you would give to, to a carer? I'm uh, probably going to pass this one out to Jody, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> we can I share, John. <laughs> I mean, I, I realize this is, that's basically your, your entire talk, but... Uh, yeah, but um, I, I guess you're absolutely right. These things change very slowly, and at this, the skill is in identifying those changes that are very slow. Um, I think meal times generally get slightly longer when um, the young men become more dependent on others to feed them. So that's not always a great marker. But I do think, um, based purely on my own clinical experience, that when somebody has become more dependent on somebody else to feed them, that's when you need to be really clu clued into changes in swallowing as well. So if you compare a length of a meal time to your own length of a meal time and take into account that somebody else is having to be involved in feeding and then it's looking still looking longer than you would anticipate i think that's a sure sign that there's some changes um and looking i think looking back a year or six months always that comparison is helpful and um, so sitting around the i don't know christmas dinner table and is everybody finishing at the t same time or is now you know the young man sat there for another 15 20 minutes usually people are pretty good at um, identifying problems in chewing but less so with swallowing so watching out for needing to swallow more than once on a mouthful as well so if you're having to slow down give extra time between mouthfuls that's always a, a good sign and any indication that there's food stuck in the throat which would look much like anybody else having food stuck in their throat um, anything you'd add John? I think that mostly mostly covers everything. Um. Um, the only one I would say be really mindful about is any infection on the chest. I think you don't mess around with that. And I think if you, were, if you have had an infection on the chest, I think it's always important to check out swallowing, particularly in that transition age and into adulthood. I think there would do be no harm to make sure that wasn't aspiration related. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, then I think uh, thank you very much for for joining us, and uh, we're finishing a bit early, but that gives us a, a little bit of a longer break. So I think that might be appreciated by some people. So yeah, thanks very much.